Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm congressional correspondent Nancy Cordes. Well, it's a busy day in Washington. The president is heading off soon to Copenhagen to lobby for his hometown, Chicago, to win the bid for the 2016 Olympic Games. Plus, the Senate Finance Committee resumes its markup of Chairman Max Baucus's health care legislation. Namely, they're taking a look at two amendments concerning the public insurance option. That's uh, being debated right now, and we'll get into that as well. I'm joined today by Ezra Klein, who covers health care for The Washington Post, and, of course, Lynn Sweet, the Washington Bureau Chief for the Chicago Sun-Times and a columnist for Politics Daily. Welcome to both of you and Lynn. Let's have dessert first and talk about <laughs> the Olympics. Olympics. Uh, the White House was on again, off again, about whether the president was going or not. What made the president decide he's got to go to Copenhagen? Well, I actually think he was going to go all the time, and that they just wanted to have an out just in case health care heated up and they couldn't make it or there was some other issue. They didn't want to get locked in. So as the First Lady said when she talked to some reporters yesterday, it was a matter of managing expectations on this one. What's the reaction been in Chicago to the official word that he is going? Because I know there was a lot of pressure coming from Mayor Daley and others. Well, I think to you have president. to separate out when you say what's in, you know what's the reaction in Chicago, which probably people thought all along he was going to go anyway. Okay. And to Mayor Daley, who really, really thought that he he was needed to go to help seal the deal. The Olympics are something of an obsession for Mayor Daley. He wants this as his legacy project. And you want to give everything your best shot, and that included, you know, for, for Mayor Daley. And as Mrs. Obama said, too, it included sending in the president. Got it. Ezra, what if the president goes and Chicago doesn't win the games? I mean, they've got some pretty stiff competition there from Rio and other cities. He's had a tough summer and doesn't really need a loss right now. You know, I, I think unlike in the Olympics, there's actually a medal for effort here. I think people will be happy if Obama went and, and advocated for their city. And I think there's a recognition that these things are done by a different committee and it's really, 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 really not the president's uh, jurisdiction. Right. And the thing that they did, they managed to pare down the president's trip to the minimum amount of time. He's leaving at night. So I suppose mm -hmm. he, he could argue he's off the clock. Mm -hmm. you know, he'll sleep on the plane. He'll be in Denmark just for a few hours to make the final presentation and then he's back on Friday. So it might even be that he's, he's, he's there. If he's there even 24 hours, well, I'd have to uh, check the time. So I think it's hard to argue that the affairs of state were left to uh, wander around without him in his absence. And I've seen that the White House has a pretty good line on this whenever they get any criticism. You know, why is the president leaving now? He's got so much on his plate. They say, well, you know, what have you got against the Olympics coming to the U.S. and well, providing all is, those it jobs? Is, right. It's made more sensitive because it's Chicago, his hometown, so it's made to look a little more parochial. But actually, the uh, the game of winning and lobbying for the Olympics has changed in recent years where heads of states do go and lobby. Tony Blair lobbied to win uh, London. Putin lobbied for a town called, I, I might mispronounce it, so I'll just say lobbied for Russia to get mm -hmm. it. So as this campaigning has evolved, heads of states now go. So it's not out of light, even if it was another city. But then again, as Mrs. Obama herself said, uh, yesterday, you're darned if you do and darned if you don't. Right. And, you know, Chicago actually already had some pretty high-profile supporters heading to Copenhagen. They had Mrs. Obama. They had Oprah. Oprah, So, yes. you know, it wasn't like brands. they had, uh, you had two you know, of the best international bananas. brands going anyway. But when you have, but they're still not heads of state. So mm -hmm. the, this whole election, there's 106 members of the IOC. You only need 50-something votes to win. So if you have a few fence sitters for whom a personal appeal from one of the biggest international celebrities might work, you want to just give it your best shot. And then if you lose, you know you lost trying as much as you could, which is the Olympic way. We heard a little bit of rumbling uh, from Chicago. Maybe you can tell me yeah. how legitimate this is from uh, people who, who really aren't wanting Chicago to get the games. Is that is there, that a big true. percentage? true. This is not a unanimous, cons uh, this is not unanimous in the city that, the, you know, it is not the obsession of every neighborhood and everyone the way it is with downtown, where the civic leaders are on board. There's a potential cost that taxpayers may have to shoulder someday. There's a lot of disruption in the building. Not everybody agrees with the plans for where all the venues are. And there's uh, activist groups that have been campaigning against it, saying that in their judgment in the end, the cost outweighs the benefit. Mm -hmm. Quick question before we switch gears, do you think Chicago's going to get it? I don't know. I've seen odds makers for people much more informed than I am that say it's neck and neck right now. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, all right, uh, let's talk about health care now because uh, the Senate Finance Committee is right now debating 
the public option. Remember, the public option was not a part of this bill, the one bill in Congress that does not have a strong public option as a component. It has a co-op. Uh, a nonprofit insurance cooperative, which was designed as kind of a compromise with uh, Republicans. They were hoping that it would be a, a middle ground that would get Republicans on board. So far, it really hasn't. Maybe one Republican vote at most. And so now two powerful Democrats are pushing to get a public option put into this bill. Ezra, are they going to have any luck? Well, they, they may have some, but I, I'd actually guess not at the moment. So the two options on the table are one from Senator Jay Rockefeller, which is best thought of as a very strong public option. It can use Medicare's payment rates, which are lower than those of private insurers. And CBO thinks it'll save the government alone, not even counting consumers and businesses, but the government alone will save $125 billion over 10 years if they include this option. The rest of us will save a lot more on premiums. Then there's Senator Schumer with what's called the level playing field public option. That cannot use Medicare payment rates. It's just like any other insurer and um, won't save as much money, but that, that's sort of the, uh, the more compromised measure there. Rockefeller's public option is one that would actually do a lot for the bill, but it's pretty unlikely to pass right now. The, uh, the morning was very heated on it, and I think you're going to see a couple Democratic defections on that one, including from Senator Conrad, who prefers his co-op idea and worries a lot about rural reimbursement. Um, Schumer's idea has a lot more potential to, to go through, and that'll be a very tricky vote, actually. If that goes in, they probably don't get snow anymore, and they really want snow. But who are the Democrats who feel safe voting against it? I'm not sure. Maybe Conrad, but which are the others? Again, oh, well, it's one just that would be vote tricky. against it, against a bill that did not have a public option. By the way, is, is Senator Burris of Illinois, who has absolutely nothing to lose, and who probably is untouchable by the White House because of all the controversy and rankle or, or between them. He's come out against. Oh, he's a come out. He's, he has said he's not going to vote for a bill that doesn't have a public option in it. So that's the problem with this piece of legislation: mm -hmm. is that you lose, you have the potential of losing Democrats on either end. And, and that's why it's such a delicate balancing act, as Ezra has been saying. Right, and I think that this debate that's going on today shows what what trouble the Democrats have when it comes to a public option, not with the Republicans, who they already know are going to vote against it, but within their own party, right, Ezra? Because, I mean, just on this one committee, they cannot get the votes to get a public option in this bill. Well, one thing we're saying, right, is that four or five committees, they could get the votes. So there's mm -hmm. one committee, and this is by far the most centrist, moderate committee, um, you know, that's going to that's gonna be considering health care reform, and that's where it's having a little bit of trouble. And, you know, we'll see. I mean, it's going to be Snow's trigger option or, or Schumer's public option. There's going to be some sop to the others. And the really big question is what happens with the Senate finance bill after it goes. I mean, at the end of the day, it could get merged with the public option in one of the other bills, or it could not. And in a way, that's going to be much more crucial than whether they pass it here. And the, the big question is what happens next. How much do well, they want Snow's vote, Well, one of the things that the House is contemplating is having a rare standalone vote because usually you never vote mm -hmm. measure, you know, item by item, as you know, covering Congress, and that's what, as you know. So it could be that to placate the public option supporters, they have a vote and say, well, we tried. Now, what do we do next? Because it failed. So uh, you know, I think they have a few scenarios to go through to try and mm -hmm. say, well, we gave it a shot, and now that there's no support, you're a realist. You can't hold out for something that's never going to happen. Right. And then the White House has a really big challenge now, because let's say the Senate Finance Committee has a bill that does not have a public option. Then you've got the other Senate bill, the HELP bill. It does have a public option. Harry Reid has to try and figure out a way to meld these two bills. Who knows how he does that? And he's already said he's putting this one off on the White House. He's gonna he's gonna make them get in there and help him figure out how to well, do this. Well, and then it should because they need a buy-in at this point from the White House in what's called conference. So if people out there don't know what we're talking about, uh, these conferences, which are designed to meld the House and Senate versions of bills, even within you know, the, you know, do competing bills within their own chambers, give lawmakers a chance to negotiate, mm -hmm. rewrite the bill, and deal. And at this stage, with the White House so hands off in the previous months, at, at this point, it, you need to have the White House in there because it, it, the, you want to have the bill that the president wants to sign. Right. Ezra, any idea how uh, they mailed these two bills? Uh, I, th I don't know if they have it. I mean, I think the big question, actually, is not even the White House. The question is sort of these centrist Democrats, Nelson, by Landrew Lincoln. And it, there's really, it, it goes to Senator Snow here. If they say we need Senator Snow on board or we will essentially join with the filibuster against this bill, if even one or two of them are willing to do that as their price to go along, they need a Republican vote, then there's not going to be a public option. But if Reid can say to the caucus, look, we've got 60 Democrats, this is what the president ran on, mm -hmm. this is what our base wants, well, no, then they can pass it without them. Well, no, he did not run on the public them. option. He did not run on the public option. It was in his bill. Unfortunately, it was in his bill and it was one of the things right, he Right, but he did it. 
having it in his bill is different than making it a campaign issue. It was not, oh. and, and I respect what you said, Ezra, but I think it was not a campaign call. But they put I, but my, my sense of the grassroots base among the right now is that they right, think that he, he wouldn't push he, that he wouldn't sign a bill without a public option. That's what he was saying earlier this summer. He, and and right, but that's different than, than what you're saying he campaigned on. And, and we know that in, in, in cases that Obama has been uh, flexible, to say the least, look at the pledge to close Guantanamo in a year. Mm -hmm. So I think you have a bunch of pragmatists in the White House who uh, will adjust, take the hit, if mm -hmm. need be, from people who say, well, you flip-flopped or you changed or evolved, however you want to say it, changes. Right. You know, it, it, you're, not, you're doing something different today than we thought you were doing uh, yesterday or the month, month ago. But... Obama always, I think the, the takeaway is during the campaign is that he was pragmatic and wanted something that would extend more coverage to more people. That's why he talked about earlier in this process of having his principles that he was talking about without wanting to deal with paragraphs and subsections. Mm -hmm. okay. But they do have to get that now in order to get the senators, which is why the public option, just as Ezra said, has so little support. You can't go into the room and pretend that it's there when you have the senators who Ezra just named saying we're not going to make the deal. So, so who knows what will happen? We'll, we're going to be debating the public option for months. Well, I think this there's is not a lot to go. debate. I think unless <laughs> somebody has this another idea, mm -hmm. or they could call co-ops public option. Sometimes you could rename something, declare victory, and move on. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the people who understand public option as as a truly independent entity that will be freestanding to provide competition to insurance companies, you have to wait and see what the animal is. Some people say co-ops could perform that function way too early to see if it can because you have to see how they structure the bill. Well, it's a fascinating debate. and We haven't even talked about the trigger idea, which is something yeah. that uh, Senator Snow uh, likes, but unfortunately we're out of time. So uh, Lynn Sweet of the Chicago Sun-Times and Politics Daily, Ezra Klein at the Washington Post, thank you both so much for joining us here on Washington Unplugged. Thank, thank you. you. Sure thing. Up next, while the current governor of New York, David Patterson, is having his own problems, former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer is once again raising his own public profile. After stepping down in disgrace a year and a half ago, is he getting prepared for a second act? Here's CBS News digital journalist John Bentley. For this reason, I am resigning from the office of governor. Many thought this is the last they'd see of former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer. A meteoric political rise, turned into a punchline after he admitted patronizing a prostitute. Well, I think you all learn, I, I would tell, I've learned humility. I've but now he's back in the spotlight again, giving TV interviews, teaching a political science class, and being photographed out on the town with his wife and daughters. So is all this laying the groundwork for a comeback? I've said I'm not getting back into politics, and it is, uh, there are many ways in life to contribute. There are many Despite that denial on the CBS early show, there are those who doubt Spitzer's contributions will be out of the public eye. Many people who know Elliot Spitzer better than I do believe he's a narcissist. And like many politicians, he misses the limelight when he's out of it. Fred Dicker has been covering politics for the New York Post for over 30 years. While he thinks Spitzer is trying to rehab his image, he says there is no chance he could return to public office. But right now, politically, he's still um, a dead duck in New York, and I don't see him doing anything in the immediate future. But not everyone is so sure. You never say that a politician isn't going to come back because uh, the most unlikely politicians absolutely do. Patrick Egan is a politics professor at New York University. While a sex scandal famously derailed the presidential hopes of Gary Hart back in 1988, Egan points to more recent affairs by Governor Mark Sanford in South Carolina and Senator David Vitter from Louisiana as examples of politicians who may yet weather the storm. Americans just are much more blasé and are shrugging their shoulders at these kinds of things in a way that they wouldn't have 20 or 30 years ago. While Americans may be more willing to forgive and forget, both Egan and Dicker point out that not only did Spitzer have an affair, he broke the law as well. And for someone who became attorney general on a law and order platform, that may be too much for even the most blasé voter. John Bentley, CBS News, New York. And that's it for Washington Unplugged. Thanks for joining us. You can join us every day at cbsnews.com at 1230. I'm Nancy Cordes. Watch tonight's CBS Evening News tonight to get the latest on the H1N1 vaccine. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.